I want to share with you what I'm going to talk today, and most of it would not be text, most of it would be actually uh, videos and pictures that we gathered. What I want to talk to you is a little bit of reflection from the last time I had the pleasure of actually speaking uh, with the association, or it was with Berlin. In Berlin, I was talking about how hackers, or how about actually Holocaust deniers, would use the internet in order to manifest their narrative. But back then, it was eight years ago, I think, uh, we could see some indications of excessive use of the internet, but the main uses of the internet for this discussion was in order to distribute reports they had, or to distribute research they were conducting about Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism, and hoping to gather attention on the internet. There was a lot of work done back then on trying to gain dominance in the search engines. So if I search, for example, about the Holocaust, the results that I would get first would be actually results about Holocaust denial rather than about Holocaust confirmation. If I'm looking about something about Israel rather than getting the good story of Israel, I get stories about delegitimation of Israel. And that was done what we called SEO, which is search engine optimization, trying to make your messages surface higher as the search results. So the battlefield were in places like search results. In Wikipedia, there was a lot of... Uh, uh, battle there, how do you edit and define uh, titles in Wikipedia which are relevant to this domain? So, for example, on any topic in Wikipedia that deals with uh, concentration camp, the Holocaust, the Nazis, there were battles of editors. One was trying to give one version of the truth, the other was trying to give another version of the truth. They were fighting the facts. We thought back then, eight years ago, that that's really a troubling phenomena. Wait what happened 10 years later, 8 years later. We're the situation that I'm going to describe to you now, that we really have a catastrophe online. Really a catastrophe of anti-Semitism or Holocaust denial, not even at the magnitude one can imagine. And what I'm trying to do in this conversation today is trying to give explanation why this catastrophe is happening, what has changed in terms of technology or mode of operation of our... Uh, rivals here, and why actually coin trends that we see do not give us uh, hope at the moment, uh, and actually we need to develop not only policy and uh, regulation, but we need to work hard on the technological front in order to address it. So my story would start actually with uh, one example. You know that Obama signed the executive order banning the Pledge of Allegiance in schools nationwide? What do you mean you don't know? It was in the news. It's in the ABC News. What do you mean? You don't read the papers? That's very troubling. People, you came to this conference, but you don't read the papers. <laughs> when it's asked, 50% of the Americans believe that's true. 50% of the Americans believe that Obama signs this executive order banning the Pledge of Allegiance in school nationwide. Why they believe it's true? Because they got this particular ABC News piece directed to them in their Facebook profile. They got it directly in their Twitter messages. When they were going actually to news items, it surfaced as a link they should read, recommended reading. When they were going actually and looking for uh, some uh, states that are part of the southern states, they saw an ad advertisement which this ABC News has uh, suggested reading. All these tactics are the coined way of spreading actually uh, hate messages and uh, fake news. I'll just give you an example. This is a tool. How it was created, this is a tool that is available online that any one of you can be in the breaking news. It's very simple. It's what we call fake news generator. You only actually go, you should put your headline, ticker, and the image, and you create something kind of like, no pick. It's a cover of a magazine. It would be a breaking news from the CNN. But you create a media item that would look to be a real, genuine media item from a reputable uh, media source, and then you have the tools available, and they're actually free to use, that you can now distribute your messages as 
micro-targeting to people that seem to have relevant interest. You can actually buy advertisements that this story would surface as the advertisement, suggested advertisement. You can even buy what we call native ads that every time that like a reputable media outlet like the CNN, others, would have a story in this area or this domain, you could buy the suggested link. So to create someone the association, hey, I'm now in the CNN, and I'm being presented with a story I should read, you actually trust the reputation of the CNN that this link is something authenticated. <coughs> I don't want to go too technical here in the presentation, but I want to explain to you what happened. Tools that were developed in the military, I was part of the Electronic Warfare Unit, what we developed it's also something called psychological warfare tools. It's how you affect, kind of like the mindset or affect the uh, psychological uh, perception of the enemy sometimes in the battlefield. Technologies that were developed for misinformation and disinformation, which is actually tools for war, were being commercialized and industrialized to be used by anyone. So anyone now that wants to create a disinformation or misinformation campaign can easily do that with the available tools. You've seen, by the way, eight years ago when I was talking about anti-Semitism and hackers, fake news was not yet a term point. No one spoke about fake news or hate speech, fake hate speech. But now it's actually known that this phenomena that we are addressing of anti-Semitism, Holocaust, denial, or hate speech is just similar, equivalent to what we have seen with the fake news. This actually spread of news from sources that are trying to affect public opinion or trying to affect our psychological mindset with fake truths using the internet as a propagation tool. And what has changed more? What has changed more that the tools now became so real? I want to share with you a two minutes video that I think is rather shocking. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Jordan Peele created this fake video of President Obama to demonstrate how easy it is to put words in someone else's mouth. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. Not everyone bought it, but the technology behind such frauds is rapidly improving, even as worries increase about their potential for harm. This is your Bloomberg Quick Take on Deep Fakes. Deepfakes, or realistic-looking fake videos and audio, gained popularity as a means of adding famous actresses into porn scenes. Despite bans on major websites, they remain easy to make and find. They're named for the deep learning artificial intelligence algorithms that make them possible. Input real audio or video of a specific person, the more the better, and the software tries to recognize patterns in speech and movement. Introduce a new element like someone else's face or voice, and a deep fake is born. It's actually extremely easy to make one of these things. There were just some supposed, you know, breakthroughs from academic researchers who work with this particular kind of machine learning in the past few weeks, which would drastically reduce the amount of video you need actually to create one of these. Programs like Fake App, the most popular and widely available for making deep fakes, need dozens of hours of human assistance to create a video that looks like this, rather than this. In August, researchers at Carnegie Mellon revealed software that accurately rendered not just facial features, but changing weather patterns and flowers in bloom. This advance is not yet available to the public. But with increasing capability comes increasing concern. You know, this is kind of fake news on steroids, potentially. Um, we do not know of a case yet where someone has tried to use this to perpetrate a, a kind of fraud or an information warfare campaign, or, or for that matter, to really damage someone's reputation. But it's the danger that everyone is really afraid of. In a world where fakes are easy to create, authenticity also becomes easier to deny. People caught doing genuinely objectionable things could claim evidence against them is bogus. Fake videos can also be difficult to detect, though researchers around the world and at the U.S. Department of Defense have said they're working on ways to counter them. Deep fakes do, however, have some positive uses. Take Sarah Proc, a firm that creates digital voices for people who lose theirs from disease. Speech synthesis is the artificial production of human speech. There are also applications that could be considered either good or bad. 
like the many, many deep fakes that exist solely to turn as many movies as possible into Nicolas Cage movies. Oh, hi, Mark. Okay. This technology, by the way, is progressing at a speed no one could have imagined. My research at the PhD was around artificial intelligence, and I'm shocked with the pace that actually this technology took. What's happened is that now we can train computers just by listening and uh, viewing enough, actually, uh, videos and content. And if they actually also ingested with enough information about the character, like enough text that is written, enough information, uh, factual information, they can create, by software, you don't need to be an engineer anymore, fake videos. So start to imagine what is happening and what would happen with both anti-Semitism and with Holocaust denial. You can create a video that looks exactly as it looked in concentration camps, exactly as it looks in some of the scenes that are now contested in, uh, in the discussion and the debate, and create genuine, or looking genuine, authentic examples of the videos and the pictures from that time. And at the magnitude and at the speed that was not imagined before, you can create in one day millions of videos. And now try to fight truth with truth. Try to find truth with just few pictures that you have, or few videos that you have, with a spread of as many as they want to create, that could be spread later, as I said, micro-targeting. You've heard about Cambridge Analytics. Cambridge Analytics actually was the tool that was developed originally at Cambridge, but later used in the election campaign in the US. What Cambridge Analytics was doing? They were just connecting to a Facebook profile, but then understanding everything about the individual. They created psychological profile of the individual. What is values, emotions. They created kind of like well-tagged storyline of this individual, and so how this individual uh, interact with media. What seem to be media that they engage with and media they do not engage with. And after creating this specific profile, what happened in the Trump campaign, it, for every message they wanted to convey to the public, like, let's assume there was now a uh, public event. Like, let's assume there was shooting or some kind of uh, debate around abortion. They created dozens of different videos and dozens of different comments, and each individual got the specific video, specific comment that he seemed to be most uh, likely to react to. So you're not creating just now one video, one news item. You're creating many fake items that now can be micro-targeted. And we don't even see them because they are not available on the search. You don't know that a particular person got his particular message. And not only that, now there are tools that make you use this targeted to specific individuals, those influencers, those that actually form the public discussion. So there are tools being used, for example, now to identify who are the influencers in a particular topic. It's now done on uh, climate change, on the uh, discussion around gas and oils, and you actually target the message to them. And not only that, you can measure impact. It's not even as if the message was just out there, but I can understand whether Mayor clicked on it. How, how long he saw the video, whether he shared it with someone else. So this level of precision in both creating fake content, distributing it, or targeting it to the individual, and measuring impact, was something we could not have imagined before. Another thing that we see, and there's incredible tools now demonstrating it, that they even have tools to measure and visualize how the messages spread. You really have tools now, again, don't go to the technical details, but you put something we call the tag. It's something like monitoring tool within this content that now trace how the message spread and the level of virality. You can now know who was exposed to the message and whether they shared it and with whom. And not only that, if you see that someone is a blockage, meaning that he's not convinced or he's trying to actually question the authenticity of the content, you just actually block the line of distribution. You make the content not available for the individual who was trying to challenge the authenticity. 
So we can control not only the content creation and the original distribution and the virality, but we can actually control how one spread it and how people who seem to challenge anti-Semitism, delegitimation, or Holocaust denial are being blocked on the platform. The last thing I want to show you is that Twitter actually became the hub for Nazi content. Twitter, which is kind of like this uh, uh, small micro-messaging platform, particularly for news, became actually the hub for Nazi content. Interesting enough that in Germany they have a version which is Nazi clean. Because of the German regulation that they want to battle with, they created a version that you can find without Nazis entities or without Nazis messages. But the rest of the world has become actually the most effective distribution mechanism. And not only that, that's also lead to something we called bots activity. Bots are automated robotic distribution. Uh, something that was claimed around the Russian campaign, election campaign, that you create actually fake entities. They do not exist. Uh, fake profiles in uh, Twitter, fake profiles in Facebook and elsewhere that are retweeting, meaning they are spreading the fake messages. So not only that you have fake messages and fake entities, now when you create the first fake story, you can create dozens, hundreds, millions of fake entities that would be carrying the message and creating this effect as if this message is really popular, it spreads widely, and normally it also picks media attention when it spreads like this. The last thing to show you maybe uh, is about Facebook. I don't want to go into deep around Facebook, but I think if you just have 20 minutes to spend, see Sasha Baron Cohen, the brilliant comedian, uh, giving a speech, uh, was actually, I, I thought at the beginning of my speech, instead of me wasting my time here, just start playing and showing you Sasha Baron Cohen, which I did give a brilliant speech about the problem, actually, with the status of the social networks, that they believe that it's part of freedom of speech to say anything. It is part of the freedom of speech to put profiles like the Holocaust, the Holocaust meet, or the Holocaust never exists. And they say it's part of freedom of speech. We're not going to censor it, let's do it surface. But the main problem is that it's not an individual with his story and another individual with a counter story. These fake profiles or these fake communities could be created as a magnitude that is unlimited by technology. I can create hundreds of them a day and spread the messages. So just to wrap up, if eight years ago I was privileged, thanks to Irita invitation to speak in Germany about what might be with Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism on the online networks, I'm now terrified to speak again here because technology has changed and assertivity of our opponent has changed and their easy mode of operation has changed. So now actually they're winning big time with the fake stories. And a lot of the policy that we're making Let's have regulation, policy for the networks, code of conduct, don't really impact this battle. So if the Holocaust is now in information warfare, we're in the losing side. Thank you very much.